In this talk or lecture, I want to introduce the third great shift, that is the shift to the period which I am terming the structuralist or structural period, which roughly I've dated between 1890 um, and 1940 or perhaps up to the 19. 60s, 70s. This is in many ways as great a transformation as the others. The first great transformation I talked about was that from linear time to uh, moving time, serial time at the Renaissance. Uh, the next was towards progressive time, the Enlightenment, and the next was towards evolutionary time. And this is the uh, last great shift um, that I'll talk about for now, and it's in relation to the rejection of evolutionism, really. And it's a dramatic, large movement which shaped the thought of the 20th century, uh, including my own. It begins um, in the last decades of the 19th century, with a kind of in-between movement, which is often overlooked, forgotten, but was very important at the time, and is a sort of transition. This was uh, a movement or theoretical system which lasted really from around 1887, 1880 or 1890 to about 1920, one generation really, and it was known as diffusionism. Diffusion means moving away from uh, somewhere. And it was based on the realization after a generation of high evolutionism that a simple model whereby each society necessarily moved through stages, um, a unilineal evolutionism, was unacceptable, ridiculous. You just had to look around you. Um, it wasn't a, a 20th century uh, invention. For example, archaeologists had been talking about diffusionism from a very early time. For instance, um, Miss Buckland, we're told by Louis, um, from 1878, uh, had presented paper after paper in defense of a radical diffusionist doctrine. And um, already when the Golden Bough, which was in some ways a, an evolutionary model stage, we all went through the stages of rationality, when it was reviewed in folklore um, by uh, alongside another great book of the anthropologists at that time, Robertson Smith's Religion of the Semites. The reviewer considered both books old-fashioned on account of their evolutionist bias. The crushing critical um, analysis or destruction of evolutionism was that basically if you looked at the world it was quite clear that countries didn't have to go through all these stages. They could borrow or adopt things from elsewhere. It was clear to anyone that um, places like India, China, many places influenced it by the West, and indeed the West itself had grown not through going from stage A to stage B, but by accepting ideas technologies and so on from elsewhere, which had come in from else outside. And this was um, brilliantly put um, by the great English historian F.W. Maitland. Um, he's quoted by Robert Lowy, he says, um, who says, any conceivable tendency of human society pursue a fixed sequence of stages must be completely veiled by the incessant tendency to borrowing 
and thus become an unknowable noumenon that is scientifically worthless. Strangely enough, he says, it was a jurist, Maitland, it's not very strange because he was also a great historian, who recognised this fact at a time when anthropologists were still chasing the will-o'-the-wisp of historical laws. And he quotes from Maitland's Doomsday Book and Beyond, written at the end of the 19th century, the following wonderful passage which I'll read. <coughs> Even had our anthropologists at their command material that would justify them in prescribing that every independent portion of mankind must, if it is to move at all, move through one fated stage, series of stages, which may be designed as stage A, stage B, stage C, and so forth, we still should have to face the fact that the rapidly progressive groups have been just those which have not been independent, which have not worked out their own salvation, but have appropriated alien ideas and have thus been enabled, for anything that we can tell, to leap from stage A to stage X without passing through any intermediate stages. Our Anglo-Saxon ancestors did not arrive at the alphabet or the Nicene Creed by traversing a long series of stages. They leapt to the one and to the other. Lowy quotes this and then comments on the passage. Present ethnographical knowledge warrants us in extending Maitland's argument. As he put it, that is Lowy, one fact encountered at every stage and in every phase of society by itself lays the axe to the root of any theory of historical laws, the extensive occurrence of diffusion. Creating nothing, this factor nevertheless makes all other agencies taper almost into nothingness beside it in its effect on the total growth of human civilization. Diffusion not merely extends the range of a feature, but in so doing, it is able to level the differences of race, geographical environment, and economic status that are properly assumed as potent instrumentalities in cultural evolution. Through diffusion, the Chinese came to share Western notions of government. Through diffusion, the Southern Plains Indians came to share with the Iroquois of the woodlands a type of sib that distinguish them from their fellow, fellow Sions living under the same geographical conditions. This was the great, the first great turning away from evolutionism. A forgotten stream to many of us and my students included, and even myself, until I started working on these lectures and came across the library of one of the last of the diffusionists and came to read a little bit of uh, the late W.H. Rivers' work, uh, or W.H. Rivers' late work, as I should say, uh, and Perry uh, and Elliot Smith and others of the diffusionists who were lecturing in uh, London and England and Cambridge in the early part of the 20th century. Few people have read this material, but it was very influential both in anthropology and archaeology and elsewhere. Uh, the central model uh, of the diffusionists, according to Vote, their basic model held that all cultural developments emanated from a heartland and moved outwards like ripples in a pool. This is a very good metaphor. So you have often um, Egypt as the centre. Everything was invented in Egypt, or a lot was, and then it diffused, rippled out, like dropping a stone in a pond. Um, there were two major schools of diffusionism, the German and the British. The British dominated anthropology from about 1900 to 1925, and it was this, rather than um, structuralism, that first destabilized the evolutionist theory. Um, according to 
Edmund Leach Fraser was an outstanding representative of the anthropology of his day, but that day had ended by about 1910. For the next 15 years, British historical anthropology was completely dominated by the diffusionist views of Elliot Smith and W.J. Perry. And it was very dominant in London and in Cambridge. Leach again writes about this um, because it was against diffusionism rather than evolutionism that the next great phase, the main structuralists or functionists as they started off as, um, most famously headed by Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown, had to come to terms with diffusionism rather than include evolutionism. Um, Leach writes that in the pre-Malinowski era, all anthropologists had thought of themselves as get engaged in the reconstruction of prehistory. He goes on rather in a Leachian way. If you will assume that savages are stupid automata, you can also assume that customs are imperishable artifacts, as hard and enduring as flint tools and shreds of pottery. You can then set about reconstructing history from the data of anthropology by exactly the same procedures as are adopted by an archaeologist in reconstructing history from the data of an excavation. In, indeed, it is because scholars of the 1900 to 1920 period thought it sensible to treat customs as though they were potsherds and old bones, that modern social anthropologists must still often share an uncomfortable menage à toi with the prehistorical archaeologist and physical anthropologist. This was a dig because archaeology and anthropology were set up together in Cambridge and still in Edmund Leach's uh, main period in the faculty. It was a faculty which had joint department of uh, social anthropology, physical anthropology and archaeology and there was a good deal of infighting between them. So this is a political statement. Anthropology it had become a study of the distribution of customs. But such ancestors this brief period are largely forgotten. Who reads late Rivers, W. H. Rivers or Melanesian societies or Perry or Elliot Smith? The views of such people, just because this is a period uh, phase which shouldn't be entirely forgotten, are summarized rather crudely or simply by Robert Lowy in his uh, summary of Elliot Smith's work. He, he, uh, Lowy writes, his actual scheme rests on a few dogmas that are easily summarized. One, man is uninventive. Hence, culture arises only in exceptionally favorable circumstances, practically never twice independently. Two, such circumstances existed only in ancient Egypt. Hence, elsewhere, culture, except some of its simplest elements, must have spread from Egypt with the rise of navigation. Three, civilization is naturally diluted as it spreads to outposts. Hence, decadence has played a tremendous role in human history. He then writes, let us then briefly summarize the contributions of British diffusionists. Those of Elliot Smith and Perry are probably nil. This is rather harsh judgment. In the range and solidity of their knowledge, the German diffusionists are incomparably superior to their British counterparts. So, having briefly touched on the diffusionists, I now want to look at the main period of what I call structuralism. Now you can, of course, divide structuralism into different phases, and indeed uh, I'll do a little of that. There's basically the first phase, which is functionalism, which is a sub-phase, the second uh, structural functionalism, and the third phase structuralism in the French sense, structuralisme. Now I've lumped them together for the purposes of this exposition because they all share the rejection of the earlier progressivist evolutionary frameworks and they also share a certain 
timelessness. They're all concerned with trying to understand the structure, the function of societies without spending too much effort on looking at the origins, the progress, the stages of how the society got to where it is. So they are united by a common underlying paradigm and a rejection of a previous paradigm, but there are different phases in this. It's a huge shift really to timelessness and it's, in this respect it's a rejection also of diffusionism which was very interested in origins. Time having unwound and become more and more progressive suddenly fragmented. One is reminded in this time or in this period of a sudden halt in time a fragmentation and a halting. Uh, I'm always reminded when I give these lectures in the past of a wonderful poem by Yeats, Easter 1916, where in one met metaphor he, he writes, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Well, it wasn't anarchy because what the uh, thinkers tried to do was to, they did feel that things were falling apart, but they tried to pull them together again by looking at their interconnections. This is a period of interconnections, the functional interconnections and later the structural interconnections. It is in some ways a great revolution in thought and one of the books about it is called The Revolution in Anthropology by Javi. Um, it's not a revolution in the true meaning of the word revolution, in other words going back in a circle, revolving back to something earlier. It's not going back except in the one sense. It is really returning to the pre- serial Renaissance vision. It's returning to a certain kind of timelessness. But on the whole, it's a movement into another paradigm. What is this revolution in anthropology, also in sociology, history, and all the social sciences, which makes it a um, paradigm shift? It's basically and uh, as well as the timelessness, it's basically about turning the huge inequality that had developed, the evolution from simple to modern, into the equality of societies. Societies now are much more like each other and not on a huge developmental growth of morality and technology and so on. This had been shifted to this, and that I think is a clue to the reasons for it, which I'll go into later. Um, but there are hints of that even in the descriptions of what happened. Javi, for example, uh, describes the revolution briefly as follows. All su surviving societies must be viable, I, in other words they wouldn't be surviving. And Malinowski go, even goes further, they are equally viable equally good, equal in fact. Now this is, from what I've talked about in the last lecture, this is indeed a revolution. I mean, backward, savage societies were not equal, but um, Malinowski and uh, others were beginning to say, well, suspend your moral judgments, have a look at these places, and don't make them inferior. Um, even though he used uh, words like savages in the titles of some of his books and himself in his diaries showed himself to feel a certain superiority. It was part of the mission of this new view to place all the different civilizations and treat them on their, in their own terms as viable and equal. I continue with Javi. The wheel has come round full circle. Um, that's a true 
uh, revolution in that sense. Prima facie differences aren't even real now. There are no differences, I'm quoting Javi. Any social system good enough for men to live in is, good as, is as good as any other. There are no savages, no differences, only human social diversity. Plato and Aristotle said all men are unequal. The rationalists said all men are really equal, but some appear more equal than others. The evolutionists said all men are potentially equal, but some are actually more equal than others. Malinowski said all men are equal, but diverse, and all diversities are equal. This is indeed a revolution. It's relativism. It's saying relative to their own conditions, um, they are just as good as us. And it is a slap in the face for the imperial racist views of the height of empire, because it is saying that the white man, white man is not superior rationally, uh, tech, well technologically he may be, but in no other way is he or she superior to the various and different societies in the world. Um, put in another way, the stages leading up to the Malinovskian revolution are as follows, as described by Jarvi. The important fact is, however, that Malinovsky, by his relativism, changed the whole metaphysical background to social anthropology. The basic problem was how to, do we explain man's differences? The Greeks said, because they are fundamental, the differences. The rationalists said, because they are superficial. The evolutionists said, by development. The diffusionists said, by the accidents of contact and borrowing. Malinowski, in my interpretation, that is Jarvi, says, Bosh, there are no differences be explained. There is only the miraculous diversity of mankind and his works. The problem of anthropology is now simply observing, describing and cataloguing this diversity. So if we, that's the end of the quotation, if we modify this somewhat by a taking it away from Malinowski alone, because Malinowski, although a kind of symbol of modern anthropology, uh, was only one among a number. For example, Boaz um, had done important field work well before Malinowski, Radcliffe Brown before Malinowski, and a number of 19th century writers. So it's not just Malinowski, it's a whole set of people. Uh, and Malinowski is an expression of this, not a cause. Uh, he gives voice to a whole new world. And he does it accidentally, of course. Malinowski was um, out doing his field work in the Trobriand Islands when the First World War broke out. And because of his um, European background, he was not considered a particularly desirable person to be wandering around. So he had to stay. Normally, he might have come back from the Trobriands pretty quickly. But because of the war, he stayed there for a very long time and did the most intensive piece of anthropological field work done by at least someone coming from Britain up to that period and uh, began to get right inside the societies he was studying. So it was an accident, but it did form one of the charters of the new anthropology. Another person who in a sense was just the next generation, a friend of Jarvi and someone who was a long time at Malinowski's London School of Economics uh, and a philosopher as well as an anthropologist who gives a very good uh, picture of what happened this revolution is um, my former uh, friend and professor Ernest Gellner who describes in his introduction to the essays by Evans Pritchard on a history of anthropological thought he conveniently and uh, brilliantly as ever, this summarizes what might be seen as the main reaction against evolutionism. He sees it, and he was a friend of Popper and 
um, knew about theories in the social sciences pretty well. He sees it as a paradigmatic switch or intellectual revolution. And um, within our framework, he sees it as, a, as important as the progressivist shift of the 18th century, the one he was particularly fond of, the Enlightenment and David Hume. This was the third revolution, the elimination of progress, and at the same time a certain um, elimination of time as a central interest in the social sciences. He writes, Evans Pritchard had lived through a revolution. Evans Pritchard was um, trained in the Malinowski seminar, but reacted against Malinowski, but he was part of that uh, structural functionist, functionist school. Evans Pritchard had lived through a revolution, the Malinowskian replacement of evolutionism by functionism, and the institutionalization of a certain style of fieldwork fused with ideas partly borrowed from French sociology, a revolution which had so completely transformed social anthropology in Britain and its, and its anthropological empire. And he goes on to summarize what is happening. Anthropology was born within the evolutionary framework. We've seen that. It was born in the first progressivist 18th century phase and then particularly with Tyler, Morgan, Maine um, and others in the 19th century evolutionary framework which was, and I'll quote this again, though I've quoted it before, more than a mere theory. It was a philosophy, a theodicy, a moral vision, a surrogate for religion. Anthropology, in effect, came into being as the time machine science. The Malinowskian revolution was precisely, in its essence, the definitive break with the time machine approach. What was being repudiated was not a naturalistic and evolutionary account of the emergence of man and human society, but rather its relevance to our understanding of how concrete societies really function. As often happens with paradigm shifts, you don't destroy the previous paradigm, you just say it's not relevant to us now. It can be put on the dusty shelves at the top of the bookshelf and we can get on with another job. So it rejected history, time and evolution. These were unknowable, what Radcliffe Brown called conjectural, not in the 18th century sense uh, that I talked about before, but just meaning guesswork. We, we don't, we're scientists, we don't engage in guesswork. The facts aren't there, so let's forget about it. I go on with uh, Gellner. The old background theory or paradigm, namely evolutionism, seemed sound in itself, yet the specific theories which, jointly with data, it inspires appeared so often to go wrong. The new method of sustained fieldwork, plunging yourself into a society, which I'll talk about a little, spending a couple of years, a year, learning the language, getting inside the worldviews, and treating seriously the people you were living with. The new method of sustained fieldwork and functionist explanation avoided both sins, in other words, unchecked speculation and argument from survivals. Data were gathered by contact and immersion, and the present was explained by the present. And yet, as Gellner says, it was full of ironies, the new approach. A true and important background idea, evolution, because uh, Gellner himself, in some ways, particularly in his Sword Plowing book uh, later in his life, was a kind of evolutionist. The back, a true and important background idea, evolution, inspired faulty method and much error. An untrue, and, or at best half-true theory, pervasive stability, irrelevance of the past, harmonious inter interdependence and mutual support of institutions, which is a crude form of functionalism, led to accurate, uh, to valuable, accurate and illuminating research. The functionist vision 
however untrue in the long run and in the abstract, does greatly sharpen the observer's eye. So you get the beginning of really the great period of anthropology from Malinowski through to the 1970s, 80s, when on the basis of what Gellner thinks is a rather crude philosophical theory of integration, people went and with the courage of this theory gathered wonderful information and analyzed it brilliantly. Gellner, uh, finally the last quote, this was the great battle for the soul of anthropology between context and evolution, in which Evans Pritchard thinks that f for context, four context are Fustel, de Coulange, Montesquieu and Tocqueville, and probably Durkheim, and for evolution, Saint-Simon and Kant. So there's the ring with French inspiration. Two people who lived through the revolution and wrote within the new framework, yet were very fully aware of the old and therefore give us an insight into the battle, were the American anthropologist, great anthropologist Robert Lowy, who first published in about 1912, who was the heir of Boaz, and Evans Pritchard, the heir of Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown and the French structuralists. And I'll now give their account of what happened. In his uh, 1927 textbook, Primitive Society, Lowy savagely attacks the evolutionists. Concerning the evolution of family patterns, if we remember that was one of the evolutionary theories from savages, hordes, through patrilineal, matrilineal, and so on. Um, uh, Morgan, McLennan, Maine, and others had tried to place a sequence of patrilineal, matrilineal, cognatic, or whatever it was. But Robert uh, Lowy writes, I can imagine the Andaman Islanders, a sibless people, um, without any noticeable partiality for either side of the family. They're very, very simple people, but they don't have patrilineal or matrilineal. Arising by successive borrowings to any stage of civilizations, without necessarily developing into either father, say, patrilineal, or mother, say, matrilineal. Uh, on uh, another of the evolutionary theories, the supposed evolution of property systems, which was so important from Morgan through into uh, Marx, and is in some ways the foundation of Marxist um, economics, on the supposed evolution of uh, property systems from communal, i.e. communism, to private property, uh, Lowy writes, the dogma of a supposed uh, universal primitive communism is a manifest absurdity. And indeed, empirical research in India, um, this is my words, showing change, show change in the opposite direction. I quote, show that in all probability this region has witnessed an evolution of real estate law diametrically opposed, opposite to that rashly assumed by speculative anthropologists. So, and uh, Lowy elsewhere shows that in very, very simple Australian um, societies, the idea that there was no property, that no one owned anything, that everything was free was complete nonsense, and later anthropologists found this to be true in simple hunter-gatherer societies. There are degrees, different kinds of property in nearly, well, in all societies. So the Marxist vision of returning to a property-free society is based on a myth. As far as for the placing of various peoples of the world on various rungs of the evolutionary ladder, Lowy remarks concerning the Polynesians that when Morgan assigned to this, I quote, that when Morgan assigned to this settled, politically organized, and marvelously aesthetic race the lowest status among surviving divisions of mankind, he attained the high water of absurdity, which accounts of oceanic explorations accessible even in his day would have sufficed to expose. It was complete, complete nonsense 
And this coming from one of the great American anthropologists of the early part of the 20th century commenting on one of his great ancestors, Louis Henry Morgan, is pretty damning. Any theories of a necessary social evolution through stages seem doomed. Uh, though he says, an attempt to embody the exuberant variety of phenomena in a single chronological sequence seems hopeless. As for the idea of progress, which was deeply embedded in this evolution of view, he concedes that one may use the word to describe technical pro advances. I quote, tools are contrivances for definite practical purposes. If these are accomplished more expeditiously and efficiently by one set of tools, then that set is better. Hence, it is a purely objective of ju judgment that metal axes are supe superior to those of stone. But he goes on that then to extrapolate this into other parts of life is unwarranted. But in the sphere of social life, there is no objective criterion for grading cultural phenomena. The foremost philosophers are not agreed as to the ultimate ideals to be sought through social science existence. Within a century, Western thought and action have swung from one pole to the other, from the extremes of Manchesterian, that's Manchester, is famous for its industrial revolution, Manchesterian individualism, to the extremes of state socialism, in other words, communism. And the student's evaluation of, say, the communistic bias of Eskimo society will not be the same if he is a disciple of Herbert Spencer, who is a great individualist, as it would be if he were a disciple of Prince Kropotkin, who was uh, obviously involved in communism. I continue a quote. The quote, of course, it is true that social organizations differ in complexity, but that, differences fail, that uh, difference fails to provide a criterion of progress. He ends uh, with a piece which relates the evolutionary framework very much to the, need, to the needs and political context within which it was developed. And this is the theme throughout these lectures, and I'll return to it in trying to explain the break between evolutionism and structuralism, but this is a foreshadowing, that the ideas, the paradigms, changed because the political context changed in the early part, the late part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century. The belief in social progress was a natural accompaniment of the belief in host historical laws, especially when tinged with the evolutionary optimism of the 70s of the 19th century. In other words, Spencer, Marx, Tyler, Maine, Morgan, McLennan and others. If inherent necessity urges all societies along a fixed path, metaphysicians may still dispute whether the underlying force be divine or diabolical, but there can at least be no doubt as to which community is retarded and which accelerated in its movement towards the appointed goal. But no such necessity or design appears from the study of culture history. Cultures developed mainly through the borrowings due to chance context. Our own civilization is even more largely than the rest a complex of borrowed traits. I'll go into this a little later probably. Almost everything that is important in Western civilizations until several hundred or a hundred years, 150, 200 years ago, was borrowed from elsewhere. The importance of this is that we cannot provide a model, this is me, for other societies. I quote, the singular order of events by which it has come into being, come into being provides no schedule for the itinerary of alien cultures. Hence, such a stage in our history, before attaining this or that destination, can no longer be sustained. The student who has mastered Maitland's argument, which I quoted earlier on about diffusionism, will recognize the historical and ethnologic absurdities of this solemn nonsense of diffusionism and evolutionism. 
Now, the other person who, slightly la later than Robert Lowy, he is really the next generation, but he was also, in a way, on the swing away, and uh, he was trained in the first period of functionalism, um, attending lectures of, um, at least attending a seminar of Malinowski and taking over the chair at Oxford from Radcliffe Brown, uh, was Evans Pritchard. And in his um, book, Social Anthropology, he writes that he feels a moral separation from the anthropologists of the last century. For, he says, their reconstructions were not only conjectural, but evaluatory. They made evaluations of um, other cultures, which he found distasteful. Liberals and rationalists, they believed above all in progress, the kind of material, political, social, and philosophical changes which were taking place in Victorian England. Industrialism, democracy, science, and so far, uh, and so on, were good in themselves. Consequently, the explanations of social institutions they put forward amount, when examined, to little more than hypothetical scales of progress, at one end of which were placed forms, it's sort of ladders, as I've pointed out a number of times, scales of progress, at one end of which were placed forms of institutions or beliefs, as they were in 19th century Europe and America, while at the other end were placed their antithesis, the bottom of the rung. An order of stages was then worked out to show what logically might have been the history of development from one end of the scale to the other. All that remained to be done was to hunt through ethnological literature, for example, to illustrate each of these stages. That's a fairly interesting summary of the evolutionary ladders of the 19th century. What then had changed, uh, according to Evan Pritchard? There had been a loss of confidence that we had all the solutions and they were at the bottom of the rung, and a belief in progress. Evans Pritchard writes, we are less certain today about the values they accepted. In part, at any rate, the turning away from the construction of stages of development which so occupied them, and the turning towards inductive that is, moving from the facts, functional studies of primitive societies must be attributed to the growth of scepticism, whether many of the stages of the changes taking place in the 19th century can be wholly regarded as improvement. The reaction against Victorianism, against the horrors of the Industrial Revolution, against the growing class system, against the uh, ecological destruction against the imperial racism meant that there was a challenging of that whole idea that they had solved all the questions and were at the height of where human beings were progressing to. Um, and as I'll go into in more detail, it's very easy to see how this sudden loss of confidence or fairly rapid loss of confidence was the result of changes of a much wider political kind which was occurring across Europe, America and the world in the early part of the 20th century. The most shocking, of course, and dramatic was the First World War, 1914 to 18. Here was a situation which I'll come back to later, but the supposed rational final destiny nations of Western Europe who had developed all this science and industry and knowledge and uh, humanity and philosophy and all the rest of it plunged themselves into four years of mindless destruction in the trenches of the First World War. Hundreds of thousands being killed in one day's battle over a few yards of mud um, the vilifying of each other, uh, the use of mustard gas and chemical weapons, 
horrific, horrific. Who were these great um, outcome of human history? And that really challenged the idea of evolution, if nothing else had done so. And it's sort of symbolic that Malinowski, although he wasn't fighting in the trenches, he was elsewhere exactly in those years developing the new intensive fieldwork method to lay the foundations for a much more humane, liberal, relativistic view of the world. Alongside it, in the trenches, uh, hundreds of thousands of those who were fighting were Indians and uh, other members of the British Empire. And it was uh, in that period that it began to be clear that the dominance of Europe over the rest of the world was not going to last. That the balance of power between Europe and Asia and Africa was beginning to shift. It was during that period that, for example, Japan, uh, which had already defeated a European power, Russia, defeated China, and was becoming really powerful in the East. So it was a rapid reassessment was necessary of the theoretical paradigm of the evolutionary superiority of the West. One, um, in such a situation, the um, loss of faith in progress was replaced, as it had been in some ways in the 19th century, loss of faith in religious belief, as I argued, with Darwinism and anthropology as a new idea of progress. In this uh, fragmentation, the center cannot hold, symbolic again that Gates was writing in 1916, right in the middle of the war. Um, and then another uh, rebellion against British imperialism in, in Southern Ireland, um, the Easter Rising. The fragmentation, the loss of confidence, was uh, met with another kind of response within the social sciences, and that is functionalism and structuralism something to bind things together again in the loss, in, a, in default of a progressive evolution. As um, Gellner and uh, Keith Thomas had earlier pointed out, the function of theoretical systems as a replacement for religions, um, anthropologists turn towards, um, away from the great theoretical systems and said, Let's look at things in detail and see how societies are held together and why they don't break apart uh, in a world that seems to be breaking apart. Let us be more cautious. Let us look at the detail. Um, and in this, um, uh, the work of people like Evans Pritchard uh, and the structural functionalists was central. So I'll end with um, a quotation from Evans Pritchard again. In the 18th and 19th centuries, he says, um, their thought was dominated by the notion of progress, of improvement of manners and customs from rudeness to civility, from savagery to civilization. And the methods of investigation they elaborated, the comparative method, was chiefly employed by them for the purpose of reconstructing the hypothetical course for this development. But all this was changed, and in his words, just as earlier the genetic approach was dominant in all fields of learning, that is, genetic growth, biological growth, the analogy with Darwin and the evolution of species, now we find, this is Evan Pritchard, everywhere a functional orientation. There was functional biology, functional psychology, functional law, functional economics and so forth, as well as functional anthropology. So in the next talk, I'll uh, look at um, 
some manifestations of this in the different social sciences, the new functional and structural approach that dominated the next generations of social scientists.